to um, to Holy Spirit's presence right now. And I'd encourage you not, f- not to be like aware of something happening externally, but of the work of Holy Spirit inside of each one of us right now. Jesus said that when the Holy Spirit comes, He will take from what is mine and make it known to you. Listen to Him as He speaks to you right now and tells you what belongs to Jesus that's in your life. As He reminds you for the Father that you belong to Jesus. That he has engulfed you in his birth and in his life. And you're the the center of every parable that he ever taught. You are the, the apple of the Father's eye. You are His great love. He has engulfed you in His death, engulfed you and I in His resurrection, engulfed us in His ascension, and He has engulfed us in the life that He is living inside of each one of you right now. He has swallowed up every ounce of death that could exist. He has swallowed up any thought that you and I might have of a grave. He is our hope. He is our faith. He is our victory. Christ in us is the incarnation. The very life of God himself. Not in someone sitting around you not in your membership in this church or any other church. Christ in you. Displays an aroma which becomes the hope of all around you that there is also glory for them. Father, we lift up uh, Carrie and Diane right now. We normally, you know, would not say people's names out loud like this. But they have spoken to us out loud. And so we respond to them with your voice and your words. And we say, may the peace of God rise up in you in such a powerful way that no devil from hell or lie from a man would be able to undo 
what God himself has put together. And for those of us in this room right now that are experiencing even some disappointment or some fresh pain from old wounds wishing we could have experienced in the past what we see happening in front of us right now. We receive your love and your mercy and your peace and your healing and we say we are grateful for what we see in Diane's heart and what we see in, in Carrie's heart. May all of our eyes be open to see your love the way that it's being seen by some of us. May all of us be able to see your love and your safety, not only in you, God, but manifesting in, in people that are your children, manifesting in your offspring, in, your, in, in, this, in a community of faith, and friends that say they belong to Jesus. May the mark in the life of Jesus mark us more than counselors and new books. And may the life of Jesus mark our counselors and the authors of our new books. Lord, I just say right now before you and before my friends so many times during a week or even during a day I lose my place as John taught this morning relying on your love for me I, I forget that and I lose it and I for, and when I lose sight of what you see when you look at me then I lose sight of what I look like and who I am and I turn to my own way Holy Spirit, we say to you, if you need to scream loudly, so it breaks through our own deafness and our own blindness, and we hear and we see you clearly. For all of our families, those that are in this room right now, those that aren't with us this morning, no one knows our hearts but you, O oh Lord. We don't even know them clearly. And we're deceived sometimes by our own emotions and our own thoughts and our own wisdom. Prince of Peace, manifest the fullness of your peace in us by continuing to transform us into the very thing you see when you look at us. May we see the beauty in ourselves that you see when you look at us. We're tired of managing our medicines. We're tired of searching for fig leaves. We long to stand naked and unashamed. Clothed only in our Christ.
Holy Spirit, would you transform our hearts to where our vision and our eyes are easily see the pain and the suffering and the struggle of the people that live around us every day, whether they live next door to us or we work with them. That our hearts would not be drains that constantly take, 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 take. But they would be fountains. That the very kingdom of heaven flows from. Father, we agree with you that in Jesus a new day began. And we will no longer put that new day off to the first day of a coming year or to the first day of next month or to tomorrow. But we will say we agree with you that today Right now, this very moment, this very existence is our new day. And it will become a new day also for those who live around us. Those whom we love and love us and those who have hurt us and those that we have hurt. We don't need to move right now, but just if there's a person to your right, would you just reach over and take their hand and pray with me? Father, bless my friend with the fullness of your kingdom, the fullness of your love. The fullness of your life. The fullness of your voice. The fullness of the help of the Holy Spirit. The fullness of the fire of the Holy Spirit. The fullness of the kingdom of God. And now let's reach to our left. Father, Bless my friend with the fullness of your presence, the fullness of your love, the fullness of your goodness, the fullness of the fire of your spirit, the fullness of your voice, and the help of the spirit to follow your voice and the kingdom of God. And to that person to your left, say this. My friend, in Jesus' name, you are forgiven. Stop carrying a feeling or a sense of unforgiveness. You are forgiven in Jesus' name. And to the right, my friend, you are forgiven. Stop carrying any sense of unforgiveness. Turn loose of that lie. You are forgiven in Jesus' name. Do we have, uh, do we have any... Um, 
Happy New Year cards today. Anybody bringing today? Because I'll be back next Sunday. Yes, we do. Can, can you guys, how many do you have? Ten. And we have some back there? Or are you just waving, Avery? It's nice to see you, son. You got some? Here's what we want to do. If you guys will pass those out to some people you think have pretty handwriting. And here's what we'd like for you to do. We don't know what neighbor you're writing to. But if you just write on there that you're praying for a beautiful new year for them and that you're their neighbor and, that, and especially tell them that God loves them no matter what. Okay? And, uh, and sign your name. And, and sign under it from Stones River Church of Christ. And then uh, this week, we will start uh, right back here on this road back here. And we'll start passing them out to, some, to the neighbors on this street right here. We'll just deliver them to them. Okay? And then next week, what we don't ma- have this week, next week, we'll bring some more cards in. And we will turn the corner. And we'll go until we get all 28 of these families on this street right here. Uh, blessed from us okay and then we're going to start praying for them just add them to your list we don't have to know who they are you'll know them one Saturday when the Holy Spirit does the same thing to you he did to Amber Hampton y'all remember how we started feeding the homeless on Sunday mornings at 8 30 in the park the Holy Spirit spoke to a girl who was not going to church was fed up with religion and told her to to go to the park and make pancakes and she did And there were three men sitting on a bench. And she gave them the pancakes. And she told them, if you don't get picked, do not feel rejected, okay, to write in these. (laughs) We'll have more cards next week. (laughs) And we'll have different people sign them. So she did that. And she told them if they'd come back the next week, she'd come back and fix pancakes again. That was four years ago. And she has been cooking pancakes and, and she, she and her friends, who are all in their, most of them in their 20s, and then some of us claim to be in our 20s, uh, they feed 100 to 175 homeless people breakfast every Sunday morning at Old Fort Park. And you are welcome to go anytime you want to at 8.30 and carry biscuits and ham and uh, breakfast casseroles. I'm just trying to think of what somebody might want <laughs> right now. Gravy, sausage gravy. <laughs> this is not the Lord. It, re- it is, but it's not, okay. And so the Lord may speak to you one morning and tell you to make ham and biscuits and go deliver them to our neighbors here. We're not going to have a program. If it takes a program to love people, we have already lost the battle. If it takes announcements to make us love our neighbors, we don't really believe the Christianity that this Christ is. And we believe that here. So we don't have to have announcements because I stalk you people on Facebook. (laughs) And I know how well you're loving your neighbors. Some of you are given awards for it. Some of you are not. Some of you do it quietly. Like Jeremy is very quiet, sublet, except during football season, he gets a little loud on Saturdays. But he is very quiet. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to tell on him. So he stopped it when he lived out, out Rockvale area or was riding home, whatever. He called me. He stopped in at the Dollar General and asked them, did they have extra toys that they could give away? And then he called privately. And I, one year, that's how we did Christmas for all those kids was the toys. They all came from there. He, he made one phone call and he asked the girl in there. Rebecca loves the same group of children nine months out of the year. And this is the second year in the row that she's been named teacher of the year here in our city and county. She's just one of many teachers in this room right now who've com- committed their lives to loving children. Because it is too hard to fix some of us who are their parents by now sometimes it's easier to start over from scratch I also want to say that I believe the Bryans are trying to make a run at the Lee's attendance record for family and uh, they're added their own row their own set of chairs extra chairs down here Chuck 
And uh, I think you need to send an email out to the troops. Next Sunday, we'll give out the little white Bible either to you or Jerry for whoever brings the most visitors. <laughs> like, it, like it VBS. This uh, Thursday night, Inner City starts. <laughs> Is that right, Amanda? Samantha? Inner City starts. If you have not signed up to work and you want to work or cook or make food or wash dishes or ride on the bus with David, then you need to let either Ben or Chuck or Samantha or some of these inner city folks know. Okay? That'd be all right? Okay. Samantha, come here. Come here. Yeah. Let's all stretch our hands out up here at them. Come here, Nikki. Them? Yes. <laughs> She's not a them. <laughs> Nikki's not a them. We're not prophesying. <laughs> Zach's going, don't go. Don't go. Pray, Nikki. Father God, we just thank you for the blessing of life. We just thank you um, as women for the, the blessing of carrying life and, and co-creating with you, God. And what a blessing it is. I just speak peace and joy and comfort in the less comfortable moments um, but Lord I just speak a joyful just an incredible pregnancy over Samantha right now in Jesus name mm -hmm. I just speak over her all the joy in the world in this moment with this baby the God, that you would open up to her just how much you love her uh -huh. in the way that she starts to get to know her little one. God, I just thank you for the revelation that you, you're going to give her in this process, in this um, incredible process. <laughs> um, we just thank you, Lord, and I just bless her. And I bless her family. I thank you, God, for her support system and just the love that is surrounding her right now. Yes. We just love her so much, and we are so blessed to, to be a part of her life and, and to be there for her in whatever way she needs, God. That's we are right. so blessed. Mm -hmm. So we just love her, and we just praise you um, for her mm -hmm. <laughs> and for this, this blessing, God. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs> a little Tonisha. I don't understand why I can't get any of you young mothers to get a hold of the name for a girl, Tonisha. I just think it has such a pretty ring to it. All right, so when you get through signing your cards when, before we leave, uh, would you get your New Year's cards to Lisa? To Lisa Randolph. Wave your hand. She's right down here. Get your New Year's cards to Lisa Randolph when you get through with those, Okay. Well, John, how long ago did, um, did um, Room in the Inn start at the White House? Just general idea. It was 88 or 89. Okay, 88 or 80, 1988 or 1989. How many of you were not born at that time? <laughs> Diane and Donna need serious prayer they have not been catching on to that new math they're teaching to the children these days I didn't say born again Chuck if you were not born in 1989 raise your hand let me see seriously hold them up high I want to see something wow that's good huh what say well, I just, if you were not born in 1989. You were born in 19, well, I'm not saying anything. Different. If you weren't born in 1989, I'm going with your story. All right. Room in the Inn started here. Room in the Inn is still happening. And uh, in this city. And it's headed for some really good um, 
shifts and transitions even right now. Four years ago, one of our families here at Stones River wound up homeless. And they stayed for a few nights in their van in a grocery store parking lot. And while they were there one of those nights, um, they noticed a car that children kept getting out of in the middle of the night. And that car had two mamas in it and their children who were homeless and were sleeping and were living in that car. And they would change parking lots all the time to keep people from the police and other people from knowing where they were. And this homeless couple, family, in the van said that cannot go on. And they were homeless. So as soon as they were not homeless, they started the way of hope. No, the way of hope. They started the way of hope four years ago. Four years ago. And the way of hope cares for, the way of hope, when I got here this morning out of my car and walked across the parking lot, I saw probably 25 children playing on those swing sets out there. And I'm so glad that the Lord, we had no idea that the number of, for the way of hope was going to sh- double, more than double in size this year, when all of a sudden we started getting calls from people saying, we're moving, Will you co- would you like to have our swing set? And so in a, in a matter of a couple weeks, we were offered three. I had to turn one of them down from Bill Santee. But the other two are the new ones out there. And now they're, this morning there were over 20 children out there playing on those. They would not have had, we wouldn't have had, but, you know, there'd have been 19 children trying to go down one slide. It would look like ministry time at a charismatic conference. It would have been real messy, okay? And so it's... Um, it was beautiful this morning to hear them laughing and playing out there and to know that that house just not sitting empty because some, because uh, some administrative committee somewhere made a business decision. Our administrative committee, they just always go, well, whatever. <laughs> let's go. Are there children involved? Yes. <laughs> Is there a chance they're hungry? Yes. Well, then let's do it. So I love that. And uh, that's been four years. So uh, about maybe, Tara, how long y'all been going? So two years ago, we started hearing about something called Club Yes. I think Angela might have been the first one that I knew of that I saw. I walked in one day to the office, and there was a, Lydia, you might have been in there then too. There was a flyer on the uh, desk in there that said something about Club Yes. Well, we get flyers and stuff all the time. I didn't really get what Club Yes meant because it didn't say. Club Yes doesn't tell you it's not like, it's not called Ministry for Homeless Children. It's called Club Yes. So I didn't pay attention to it. And more stuff started coming through. And it turns out that Club Yes um, is this neat thing that this lady here in town is doing for homeless children. And they, most of them don't even actually know that that's being done for them because they're homeless in some way. They're just, they're just hearing a bunch of children who hear, who hear no constantly every day in their life. No, we cannot move out of a hotel. No, we can't get a house of our own. No, we can't eat again today. No, we don't have chicken this weekend. No, no, no. There was somebody that said those children need to start hearing yes. And they ought to hear from God. Somebody needs to say yes to these children on behalf of God. Because all of God's promises for them is yes and amen. Not no. And so, um, somehow, they needed a place to have an Easter egg hunt. We started keeping up with them on Facebook. But somehow they needed a place to have an Easter egg hunt. So, they had it here. And there were just about a hundred homeless children that were here for that Easter egg hunt that day. And Christina Craig came, a friend of hers, and did a worship time. And they hear these homeless children, Christina's up here with her guitar leading worship, you know, and hear these homeless children are dancing their little holy hineys off out here to, to just, just, you know, celebrating God. And it was so beautiful. If you had walked in, you had, would have no idea that this was an Easter egg hunt for homeless children because joy looks the same on everybody's face. Happy looks the same on all children. And so, uh, we began to beg her. 
can we do, can we be a part of anything you're going to (laughs) do? We were kind of pesky about it. On purpose. Kind of, we all got the Nikki anointing for the way we got Dan Moeller here. Nikki just hounded him until he finally said, okay, leave me. If you, if you won't call me this week, if I tell you I come, will you give me a break? And she said, yes, kind of, yes. And so we hounded Tara until she let us do more stuff with Club Yes. And it's a beautiful thing that these little Club Yeses exist in all these elementary schools. So... About, um, I don't know, a couple months ago, I got a phone call from her and she said, I have to make a decision. We will either be a 501c3 or 3c. C3, 501c3 nonprofit, or we can exist as a ministry uh, under a church. Their, their, their nonprofit status. And, and I believe we're supposed to be with the church and... I have no idea anything about whatever Church of Christ is. <laughs> but I do watch you love on the poor. And so could I, be a, could I be a part of y'all's, what y'all do? And I said, well, let's pray about it. Okay. <laughs> but I really can't say okay by myself. You got to meet these other guys. You got to meet the shepherds. And... Uh, and that's a fun thing. You're not coming before a board that, where they're going to grill you. It's a fun thing. Come in there and tell them what you do. You'll have them all crying. And they'll ask probably two questions. And then, and then you know, we'll, we'll ask the administrative committee to figure out everything we need to know to make sure we have you covered good and right. So, and that's what happens. So, Tara, come on up here. Ann, you want to come up here with her? No? My friend Ann's here too? Tara, come on. Ann, come here. I want y'all to meet my friend Ann Bratton. You can go back and sit down. She made me promise I wouldn't bring her up. Oh, did she? <laughs> yep. Okay, you can... St- Look, she's with Ann. She's fine back there. Ann, meet <laughs> Ann right next to you. No, <laughs> Ann's sitting right next to you. Everybody wave at Ann Bratton back there. Wave back, Ann. Okay. Um, Tara, this is the girl that started loving on all the homeless children. So you'll have to hold that kind of up close. All right, like this? Yep. Are we good? So tell us how all this got started. Okay, well, about five years ago, I was doing a community outreach program called the Cupcake Crew, and we kind of organized um, community service projects for schools. And about three years into that, um, we got an email from an ESP director at Mitchell Nielsen, which is right down the street, a school we worked with all the time. My kids went there um, at that time, and the email just said, please help. And when I read it, it was sent to me and I think 18 others, and they had just recently done their Thanksgiving meal with the students. And they kind of asked some of the students who were considered homeless, there was 50 at that school at the time, um, what they wanted for Christmas. And their answers just really, the teachers weren't expecting to hear the answers that the children gave them. Um, They didn't ask for toys. I think one little boy wanted somebody to toss a football with him. Two little girls wanted their hair braided. One boy asked if someone could come eat lunch with him. That's what they wanted. They wanted time. And so the teacher reached out to us and said, you know, we've worked with you guys a lot um, in the past. Is there something you can do? So I got the email on a Friday, um, and I cried all weekend because there was nothing that I could do over the weekend. And by Monday, we had over 50 people wanting to be involved. And we didn't have a name or anything like that at the time, but we just had to do something. So we quickly um, kind of organized, and we started by sending mentors to the schools and, uh, and just kind of adopting these kids. Um, we've been in there in extra classrooms washing kids' hair because parents didn't have um, the accessibility to water or shampoo or anything like that. So we started that way, and then, um, yes, I did get a message from you. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know who you were because you yeah. didn't tell me you were a pastor. I'm like, who is this guy emailing me? saying I could use a building, and I wasn't sure, but um, Angela quickly messaged me, too. There you are. Hey. (laughs) Is this, do you know him? Do you know this Tony guy? Um, But no, you know, we've been working, and I kind of look around the crowd, and I see a lot of people I know. Um, I teach for inner city ministries, too, which I think I'm the only teacher there. It's not a part of the church, so, um, but I've been working with you guys for probably about almost a whole two years now, and it's such, such a good fit, but 
we just kind of follow the you know, Holy Spirit. Every time Spirit. you move back to, to hide, I will move back Do, further. Am I moving? Yes. Do you want me to just step Thank like you. that? Is that? I told them I don't like to speak because I'm kind of like, there's a reason they put me at the kid table well, she when keeps I go moving to back and I'll just keep going. <laughs> but no, honestly, we just kind of always follow the Holy Spirit wherever we go. We don't always have a plan. I mean, we have certain things we do. I mean, on Fridays, we have a feeding ministry um, where we've kind of teamed up with school counselors. So the kids, you know, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the backpack program where kids will get food on Fridays to help supplement the weekend. But usually it's just a little cup of mac and cheese and a fruit cup. And my kids eat more than that in one meal. So kids that rely on more food um, or would rely on that for just their entire weekend, um, we actually build relationships with the counselors and bring them food every week from Feed America First. Um, so we do have certain things that we do weekly, but honestly, it's just about being open and listening to the Holy Spirit, um, having our eyes open constantly. Um, I know there's times where Ann and I have been driving to go help feed the homeless, and we'll just see someone on the street and we'll pull crazy maneuvers in the road trying to get to them. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. And we're really excited about being part of the church. What is the Friday morning thing that uh, you and Ann and uh, Angela's been sneaking around some doing? <laughs> That's the, the feeding ministry where we, we pick up um, from Feed America First. Where do y'all deliver? Um, right now we go Mitchell Nielsen, Hobgood, Holloway High, um, Bradley Academy, and, and R- what? and motels, and um, then Rock Springs Elementary, and any schools that, that call us. Like, do y'all ever go to this motel right down here? Murfreesboro, Murfreesboro Motel? motel. Yes, mm-hmm. yes, sir. And then we also have families that have been staying at Way of Hope that are at Murfreesboro Motel now, so we always try and keep um, up with our kiddos and stuff. Sweet. Okay. Is there anything else you want to tell us? Um, well, we work with Amber Hampton, too, yeah. who you were just talking to, um, and it was kind of it was kind of funny how you said just kind of listen to the Holy Spirit because one morning I really didn't know much about Amber. Um, one morning I just kind of popped up out of bed just thinking I need to go to this breakfast in the park I keep hearing about. And um, I got dressed, knew nobody there. And I went and I said, hey, you don't know me, but do you have any um, thing for the children who attend this breakfast? Because I think there's about 100 to 130 people who attend the breakfast and most of them sleep outside in the woods. Um, but there are children who come from Way of Hope, Salvation Army, maybe some of the government housing programs. Um, and I think we've had families who maybe have been sleeping in cars. Mm-hmm. Wasn't there a family who was sleeping in the car, Ann, when you went? So we, uh, we just asked, we offered, we said, that's what we do. You know, that's what we're called to do is to help the kids. So we've been working with them for probably five months now, um, just making sure the kids have a program there to teach them about God and love. Mm. What else? What else? (laughs) Um, Well, one of the coolest things that I love about Club Yes is that it's not just a ministry for the kids. Um, Sometimes we get into ministry thinking that we're going to help others. But we learn the whole reason God gave us that ministry was to help us. You know, we don't just get into it. We think, oh, we're going to, you know, save these people. And it's not about that. Um, Sometimes God gives us a ministry because we're the ones who need saving. And that's definitely what Club Yes was for us. Um, But it's really cool because if any of you ever want to volunteer, we, it's always, we always have our children with us. Um, It's definitely a family effort. And all the kids are treated the same because they are all the same. God sees them all the same. So whether it's a volunteer kid or a kid that we're helping, um, they're all Club Club Yes kids. And all of them get treated exactly equal because they are. Okay, so you guys live right down here on Lynn Street, right? Or right, right over here in Mitchell Nielsen neighborhood? Yes, sir. Okay, what's up with your garage? <laughs> um, if you drove by my house, you might think my porch, you might think that I'm a hoarder. And it's kind of the volunteer's joke um, because I will spend hours trying to clean my porch off and I will leave and I will come back and the hoard is there once again and it's kind of just, I think, a joke that God plays on me sometimes. But um, my my, I have a two-car garage, and we do have huge sorting bins. So we do have a, a storage unit, um, but our storage bins are full of clothes, toys. Um, we helped y'all, and we kind of teamed up and took care of, how many did we say all together? Almost 400 children at Christmas at this Christmas. year. At um, Christmas. So all that basically gets staged out of our, our home because we're a mobile ministry. So um, people just drive by her house, <laughs> and they drop stuff off. Yes. They've... they've They'll call and say, hey, where's the woman that does the cupcakes or the Club Yes thing? And doesn't she live over there? And then they'll just drive by in the, in, 
And they do. Angela, you've been there, right? Yeah. And it's if they different. can't find it, they come here and drop stuff off on the front porch here. But it's just a beautiful part of a beautiful thing that's happening all over the city that we get to be a part of. And that is that there's this net that God is. It's, it's like walking on a tightrope when you're in extreme poverty or in extreme danger and uh, without a net. But with people like uh, Tara and Ann and uh, Amber Hampton and our Angela and many of you and people from all of the city, it's creating a net under that tightrope for children and for mothers. It's not that we don't care for men as well, but traditionally resources have been there for men and we have beds for men in our city we don't have that for families especially women with children which is uh what, what way i hope has gone to help so uh i honestly just told um tara that it is you know it's like a blessing we're receiving to get to partner with her it, it, we, we don't offer anything other than love and she has all the volunteers she needs she, we're, we're not adding another thing to our volunteer list. Anybody that wants to ever be a part of anything, she's going to do, and you'll see them in the bulletin and, and stuff. Obviously, anybody can be a part of anything, but there's nothing, there's no expectation. Some of you, we've already been involved in what she's doing in different ways, but um, this morning was just a way to introduce everybody to her and her to everybody else. And um, we'll all see if we remember your name. You'll have to see if you remember all of our names. It's. It's good. So um, what I want to do is ask the shepherds to come up and um, gather around uh, Tara and pray for her. Anybody else that wants to come up too, but I just want to make sure that we had the shepherds up here with them too. So, And maybe if anybody gets a prophetic word, or anything the Lord's given you for her, uh, to share that as well. So, he, Yeah, come on in for prayer. Use you guys. Yep. Anybody? Lord, we're so thankful that uh, you have instilled within some very special people this burning love for those in need, especially our children. I'm so thankful for Tara and her vision of reaching out to these, these children who are desperately in need of love and desperately in need of support. Lord, I just pray that you will abundantly multiply um, all of the efforts that, uh, that Tara and her, her co-workers are investing in these children. And Lord, we just stand back and watch for the miracle. Thank you, Lord. And we're so happy here at Stones River to have uh, Tara and her ministry uh, as part of what we do here. And you, we pray, Lord, that you would equip us to provide the kind of leadership that uh, Tara's group needs, the kind of support and the kind of understanding that she needs. But Lord, we thank you for the blessing it's brought to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Anytime anybody ever gets anything from the Lord for them, just... They are wide open to receive it. So turn to Luke 15. Um, and and uh, I'm going to do this in about six and a half minutes. And I'll tell you when to start. So I made a picture and sent that to him. And here's what he said. Uh, we obviously know Luke 15. I've only preached on it uh, 87 times in the last three and a half years. <laughs> it's a story of the prodigal son. There's, there's a lost sheep and a lost coin and a lost boy. And listen, sometimes when you look around and you see people, people read their Bibles now on, uh, on their phones. So it doesn't mean, thank you, it doesn't mean that um, somebody is... Um, playing Atari. It could mean that. 
<laughs> but <laughs> you'd miss a, your 88th good message on the prodigal son if you did. Um, okay. <laughs> Listen, God just moves in such amazing ways. And I will hold it together and uh, we will look at this. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Papa. Okay. Where did I tell you to turn? Y'all know this story. I think uh, when I look at the father, I look at the, the youngest son, and I look at the oldest son. I see uh, uh, two people there that had an extreme struggle with their part in this passage. And I see one that seemed to not struggle at all. Uh, the father seemed to be really doing okay and, and walking in a great deal of confidence. So much confidence that when his youngest son came to him and said, I'd like to have what's mine. The father not only gave the youngest son what was his, he divided it up among them both and gave them both their inheritance at that point. It's almost as if the father didn't believe that the money was going to run out. It's almost as if his confidence in his resources were so great that for him to divide up their inheritance and give it to him then, knowing that he has still got to run this entire ranch, this entire place, that doesn't seem wise. We, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't give that kind of uh, wisdom, counsel to anybody. Yes, give it all to them. Give them their inheritance. Turn them loose. One of them's request, especially the younger one, showed a great deal of immaturity. And yet at the same time, a great deal of confidence in who his father was. The two that struggled in this story, if I put myself in their places were, the young boy, when he got to that place in the story where it says, and when he came to his senses, if you've got a NIV, if you've got a King James, I think it says when he remembered who he was, um, something like that, something close to that. Um, he got up and went home. Now, here's the thing that is a struggle for me. I get not wanting to be there anymore. I'm not sure I feel that excited about going back to the one who gave me my whole inheritance and telling him that I have blown it all and to give me another chance. Now I'm assuming a little bit in this. That, except for the fact that I've been a part of some of those walk homes, walks home. And they have been very slow ones for me at times with my own daddy growing up. You ever been told, wait till your daddy gets home? Where were you located at about 3.35 in the afternoon when he normally pulled in the driveway every day? I know for me, it was like the neighborhood right down the, it's the next neighborhood over at a friend's house who I had to go meet that day just to get somewhere else and hide. But you could hear my dad's whistle in three counties. He'd step out the back door and he'd go, just like that, I can't do it. And it would go on and on and on, <laughs> echo off, bounce off of houses and move through the neighborhoods like this big fire. And I could hear it. And the boy with me, who I didn't even remember his name yet, would say, isn't that your daddy whistling? I didn't hear anything. <laughs> yeah, it's him. I heard him do that to your brother last week. Oh, no. It was a bird, a large bird, a condor. <laughs> <laughs> prehistoric oh it was not my dad <laughs> shut up <laughs> but I knew that four and a half minutes later it would come again yep he'd go back inside get him a little Debbie oatmeal cake 
and a cup of coffee, four and a half minutes when he finished, even louder. I mean, by that time, I can hear people stepping out in their backyard going, Tony! <laughs> Multiple people. Your daddy is whistling for you. Bunch of troublemakers. <laughs> he struggled, Chuck. How long did it take me and you? We still inch our way sometimes. And then there was that other brother. He obviously had a hard time with the whole thing. I'm not going to that stinking party. We party at graduations and weddings and new babies. We party to celebrate. We party when people do something right. We don't party when people have done something wrong. Jesus is just not easy. We make Jesus so easy. We know how Jesus would vote. We, just, we can just get Him down to where He fits into our culture and our lifestyle and Jesus becomes just easy. You know why Jesus is easy? Because Jesus is a lot like me. He thinks like I think. He makes decisions like I make them. He likes the people I like. He doesn't like the people I don't like. He's uncomfortable with the people I'm uncomfortable with. He's comfortable with the folks that I'm comfortable with. It's like I have my own Bible that started out like this. In the beginning was Tony, and he created God in his own image. <laughs> he, got God, he got a God that will back him up, that will amen what he believes. Jesus is not easy. Religion is easy. Christianity a lot of times is easy, especially if you're on the western side of the world. But Jesus of Nazareth is not easy. Because he comes over, I, I was reading earlier in, I think it's John 16, where, um, when Jesus said about the Holy Spirit that He will take from what is mine and make it known to you. That is why I said that the Holy Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. I'm fine with that. I just want to choose who He makes it known to. And I want to decide, does He make it known to them before or after they straighten up? It's amazing to me. He made it known to me before I straightened up. But after I straightened up, I'd like for him to make it known to everybody else before they straighten up so that when they straighten up, after they straighten up, because they need to do something first in order to get the message from heaven. But well people don't get healed. Sick people do. Healing comes to people who need to be healed. When, when the Holy Spirit comes over and says to this guy who's... Still wallowing around the pig pen. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. I mean, there's been no prereq. No, you know, we've not thought this through yet. We don't know whether he'll be a good tither or not. We have no idea what his attendance will be like. It could be sporadic. We need some gifts and we need some people in the choir. This guy right here, can you sing for me a minute? Uh-huh. Is there any way we can make you white before the day's over with? I mean, that sounds so crass to us right now, but 40 years ago, we would build churches down the street so that someone of a different color, would we would pay for them to worship over there. Now, we're against that kind of horrible stuff now. So we let that kind of stuff come out of it. We actually didn't let it. It kind of forced its way out. And we had no choice but to accept it. Not everybody. I'm not making a blanket statement over all of us. But as a, a large nation kind of thing, we usually tend sometimes to learn to love people when we're forced to. When Paul starts saying things like, no, you can't look at that person anymore from a worldly point of view. You used to do Jesus that way. You didn't see him as something from heaven. You saw him just as a man. But we do so no longer we now know He's from heaven, and so you can no longer look at that person that way. 
Well, I don't agree with their lifestyle. Well, that ain't got anything to do with it. If, if God had decided to love us based on our lifestyle, Jesus would not have come yet. He didn't come once our lifestyle was in good shape. He came when we were dead in our transgressions. I'm not preaching to you because I believe you need to hear this. Nor did I mean to spit on you, Angela. I'm not preaching this. I'm not sharing this because I believe you need to hear it. I believe God wants to do something in our lives that is so powerful and so strong that it sets me free of every fear I've ever had that God could not take care of me enough that if I loved any person on this planet that God would not protect me and if He did not protect me at that point it was only because He had a greater purpose for that person for them to know who He is because I already knew it. We don't mind missionaries. We do not mind missionaries living in object poverty even giving their lives to God. We'll make heroes out of them. But don't ask me to give up something I've worked my life for. Jesus is not better in the mission field than He is here. The commitment to people in in places where it is difficult is not greater on people who live over there than it. The call is the same for us. It might cost us some things. We might wind up in places. I'm going to tell you, I really believe this with all my heart. We spent a long time in the United States and it doesn't matter which denomination or non-denominational denomination that you're part of or grown up in or whatever. We spent a lot of time trying to figure out how we can stop them from making us uncomfortable for two hours on Sunday morning. I'm going to tell you, Jesus did not give His life so that we could figure out how to be comfortable and stop being uncomfortable on Sunday morning for two hours. Jesus came so that captives would be set free seven days a week, 24 hours a day. The discomfort we need to be praying for, we need to be saying, Oh God, send Your Spirit to so unsettle me in any place where I am settled in, in, in something that does not look like, smell like, taste like the kingdom of heaven, so unsettle me that I can no longer drive by someone walking in the rain with extra food in my car and not pull over and hand it out the window. That is where our discomfort must come. Writing checks, which I'm for. Right then, the administrative committee went, huh? No, don't say it. Although Brandon looks calm and cool over here. We can join the JCs if we just want to be a, a part of a great club. We can pay dues. It looks just like church. Except they don't throw people out when they make mistakes. There is something beautiful God is doing. But it is, going to, it is going to bring such a discomfort. The kingdom of heaven is going, it, it, it does not come like to join in what we're doing. It shows up and says, here I am. Everything that doesn't smell, taste, touch, look like me, be gone in my own name. Jesus don't actually have to say in the name of Jesus. When you're Jesus, you can just say, and everything that's not of you starts scattering, not of me. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing that God is doing. Chuck, it is a beautiful thing that God is doing. I know 9 o'clock's early, but I'm telling you, if there's any way you can get here to hear the next eight sessions of John King's class on the atonement on Sunday mornings. You do not want to miss it. You don't get extra points. Sorry. (laughs) Sunday school actually does not count in heaven. It's just the worship service. We just found that out a a, a couple years ago. That's not on the, the counting board. 
That's why David took it off the little number thing in the back, really, back there, because the, God don't care. That's why we quit having Wednesday night once we found out that it wasn't going to count for nothing. <laughs> Deborah's going, no. Tony, we have visitors here that we love. We'd like to keep them. <laughs> Listen, I, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. I mean, this is really an encouraging message, I'm telling you. It really is. Jesus has come. Shouldn't that be the most awesome thing that we're excited about? It freaked out everybody in that day. For those 33 years, He was the scourge of the land to people who had something they were afraid of losing. But to people who felt like they had nothing, He was called a Savior. But if you didn't feel like you had anything to be saved from, what do you need a Savior for? It's a beautiful thing that God is doing. The kingdom of God has come. John said something this morning, I forget what to call it. it was a, it's a process where two people are trying to communicate and one person says something and then they ask the other person, what do you think I'm hearing? What do you call that? Is it repeated? It's like a feedback loop, okay? What do you think you heard me say? It sounded like it was much big, more important, like a big name when I first heard it. But it is powerful because I think that's what God spends 99% of His time doing with all of us humans. What is it you thought you heard me say? Where did you get that idea? Who told you that? Isn't that powerful? That's, it's one of the, it happened in the, in, cre, in the creation story with Adam and Eve. God, see, God creates Adam and Eve, says these beautiful, wonderful things to them. The next conversation they have, um, uh, the, they're repeating back to God what they'd heard from the serpent. And God says, who told you that? Where did you hear that from? Because you didn't hear it from me. Why are you hiding? You haven't ever gotten anything from me that told you you needed to hide. I've never run and hid from you. I didn't tell you if you messed up, you need to, you need to beware. You better run, hide. Where'd you get that from? I think God spends most of His time through the work of the Holy Spirit saying to us, Who told you that? Who told you that you, there was distance between me and you? Who told you you couldn't pray because you messed up last week? Who told you that I couldn't hear your prayers? Who told you that something can separate you from my love? Who told you that? Because it wasn't me. We're in, a, we're in an amazing time. I don't think it's any more special than any other season in all creation. I don't think that there is a... Um, I don't think that this is some special time. I don't. I don't think Jesus is any more alive in us right now than He's been for the last 2,000 years in believers. I don't think Jesus is any more alive in, in, cre in, in people as He has been since creation. I don't think the blood of Jesus is doing anything new. I don't think the work of the Holy Spirit is any more powerful now than it was three years ago. I don't believe in revivals like that. I believe there are times when we believe it more and it makes it more real to us. I believe there are times when we see it better. And it, but, but there's no improvement by the Holy Spirit on what He's doing. But there is, Paul kept praying, I'm praying the eyes of your heart would be enlightened, they'd be open, that you can see the truth about what, what already is. You can see that I emptied heaven because I love you so much, Harold. I emptied heaven. I picked up my, I packed up everything I had that you felt was distant from you, Harold, and I, I rent this veil that, you, that was between me and you in two from top to bottom to where you couldn't have anything to do with it. It would take me to do it from the top to bottom. And I packed up and moved into a new house, and that house's address is Harold. Everything from heaven lives in Harold now. And like John said this morning, there are people in this room that all believe 
Some of us believe different things about how that happened. The exact ways that had happened. But one thing is for sure. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. And Harold is a new creation. Such a beautiful new home that all of heaven packed up and moved and lived inside of him. It showed up kind of like this. Harold, the kingdom of heaven is here. The next time it spoke to Harold, it said, Harold, the kingdom is near. And the next time, what Harold knew was, Harold, the kingdom of heaven is in you. And I will never leave you nor forsake you. Harold, my house, Harold. (laughs) Don't you wish your name was Harold? (laughs) That's the truth about you now. I don't know how long you believe it's been the truth about you, but that is the truth about you now, Ann Farrell. You are the house of God. Prettiest house on the block. <laughs> I, that is exactly right. Hey, let's all stand up. Holy Spirit, make us, help us to become like the younger son, that when we hear your voice speak to us and go, psst, you're, you're living in the wrong house right now, Tony. You don't belong in this place. Now, I'm going to remind you who you are so you can get up and go home to your daddy. Help us to run as fast as we can. Of course, it's like Matt Winneborg said, you're going to take about a half a step and run smack dab into Papa. Because He is the one who's come to the pig pen to get you. It's not a long run home. The one who whispered to you and remind you who He is, as soon as you stand up, you run right face to face into Him. He got there before you did. He didn't even meet you at the house. He just reminds you, you are my house. Quit believing lies. So Holy Spirit, help us to see that quickly. Because we are the examples for people out here who believe that they're separated and lost away from God. And many of them have been believers for years and they've just given up on religion and given up on organized church. But they have not given up on you. Just help us to be reminders that when the heart heads home, it runs right smack dab into Papa. And Father, I wish I was the only one in here that had some older brother in me. But it is, it's a, maybe one of the hardest things we do is to forgive when we've been badly hurt. As a community, help us to be people who help each other walk in forgiveness. That we're not a people who we allow each other to walk in unforgiveness, we will be bold enough and courageous enough and love a friend enough that we will say to them, no, unforgiveness is not healthy for you. It's not healthy for any relationships you have. It grows like a a root in there and bitterness becomes a little tree that grows and then it starts to affect everybody around you, every relationship you have. So we're going to walk in forgiveness and I'm going to tell you every time I, I see that, see fruit from that tree of bitterness, that fruit from that tree of unforgiveness. Lord, give us the, the love for each other to walk with each other and help each other walk in forgiveness. Constantly. So here's, Father, here's what we want to be. We want to be people that run, that our heart runs home quickly. And we want to be people who learn to celebrate uh, when Papa's celebrating. The truth of the matter is that the older boy didn't own the farm. The daddy did. And when the daddy says it's time to party, the older boy better get his honey dancing. Father, we pray that we will, we will run home quickly and dance quickly. We'll be quick dancers. Woo! I've always wanted to say that in church. We'll be quick dancers. <laughs> quick celebrators. Quick celebrators.